Describing the Ozarks is like chasing wild geese. It's the feeling that you remember. We find the Ozarks not as a place, but an ethos. The lived experiences of time and days, years, eons. Home to the special and unique. Pristine springs, creeks, and rivers that carve the billion-year-old mountains. An abundance of wildness, plants, and animals. Traditions passed from generation to generation and shared on front porches as well as wireless earbuds. Cuisine created and prepared with what folks caught, grew, foraged, or raised. Roots birthed in the legends and lore of the Elder Mountain. Go deep. Go Ozarks deep. Your experience. Words are not necessary. This is where it all began. Much of this tour is deeply dependent on your imagination because the time we speak of is far in the past. To see the beginnings of West Plains, we must imagine this prairie without buildings, without improvements, and mostly without people. This area you're looking at was once a thriving village of Osage people who lived here by a prolific and dependable source of pure, clean spring water. And they harvested plentifully game, tree fruits, and nuts, and crops they had planted earlier. There were no roads, but in 1832, soldiers came and gathered all the Osage they could find and moved them to unsettled land in Oklahoma, freeing the area for European settlement. In 18 and 39, there were no roads leading to West Plains, so the first pioneers came in two wheel ox carts hauling cooking utensils, food, clothing, seeds for planting in the spring, and small children. There were no trees inside of downtown West Plains. The valley was covered with blue stem grass so tall that you could see a horseback rider, but not the horse. There were huge herds of elk and deer. There was a path worn ankle deep by Indians, deer, and elk walking single file between Thomasville and West Plains. The first settlers traveled that path, cutting out the scrub brush wide enough for the ox carts to pass through. The early pioneers did not have much money, but they didn't need much money because there were no stores to buy anything closer than 100 miles. The first to arrive was Josiah Howe in about 1839. He found a man named Adams camped by the spring just west of here, and he brought the other man's improvements, such as they were. He added a house, outbuildings, and quarters for his slaves. Here on this site, sometime later, his second son, Josephus, built a house that became the first store, and later the village's first post office. That's significant because that's how the town got its name. Missouri as a state was only 18 years old at that time. With the Osage gone, it was still mostly wilderness. The early settlement was at Thomasville. That was ahead of the navigable waters at that time. A lot of our springs that used to run kept our rivers up quite a little more. And it was ahead of the navigable part, and that's where people settled. Thomasville set up as a pretty good little settlement. And then as people began moving out, of course then they lived off the land, as we say. There was, uh, they raised very little in the way of crops, just whatever they could find to eat and uh, lots of game to eat. And as they began to develop to the west, there were no trees in this area, absolutely barren. So that's why they named the people that came this way. They went west over the plains. In time, Josiah's second son, Josephus, now an adult, built a pine log cabin here, started a store with supplies brought in from Thomasville, and made application to the federal government to establish a post office. Josephus sent someone to Thomasville to fetch Judge John R. Woodside. He came over, examined the site, and said, well, what are you going to call yourselves? In order to have a post office, you have to have a name. They asked Judge Woodside his opinion. He said, well, here you are on these plains west of Thomasville. How about we just call you West Plains? 
in the winter of 1848. That's just what they did. Our family owns a farm down on South Highway 63 that my great-great-grandfather first bought in 1849. He came in here by a covered wagon from Tennessee. As I was a boy, I would go over, uh, get on my horse and ride from the old Little's Place across Chapin Cross and then up the, the uh, uh, railroad track right away there and over my granddad's house. My, grand, my father was one of seven boys and three girls, and my grandfather was one of seven boys and three girls. And the old homestead, the old house, had a pump organ in it, and I never knew anybody could play that. And one day I was over there, and, and one of my uncles, Crazy Freddie, we called him, his name's Harold, I just grabbed, just got over there and just played away. And, and uh, Uncle Ed went back and got a harmonica and started playing, and I was pretty surprised. I got talking to my grandfather about music, and he said he couldn't play anything, but there was an old song that he had learned from his father. And he said his father learned it from his grandfather when they were traveling uh, by wagon uh, from Tennessee into Missouri. And I have heard since then that it is really, truly an old time song. And so they passed this song down through the family. Now, some of you have probably heard it and some of you will hope to forget it, but it goes like this. Had an old dog and his name was Blue. Now he was big and a good one too. Old Blue's foot was big and round and you bet your bottom dollar he could set him down saying, come on Blue, I'm a coming too. You're looking at the spot where West Plains became a town. Across the valley that was for centuries an Osage village is a pile of logs that was once the town's first school, right next to the present one. Now there were a lot of springs, particularly in the West Plains area. Apparently it's because, if you'll think about the topography around here, West Plains is surrounded by hills on all sides except going down the valley which is where Howl Creek goes. And those springs were all running, well running, because uh, Howl Creek was a running stream. Now let's go find that spring where Josiah settled. This is where Josiah Howl first camped. There's a spring on the lower level of this building, now called the Historic Post Office. And supposedly he camped there through one season. It was a common uh, stomping ground of Native Americans also. Yes. On the left is a large square brick building built in 1931 by WPA workers as a new United States post office. They built it over the spring where Mr. Adams camped and where Josiah Howe's family built their homestead. When the post office was built, it was with the understanding that the spring wouldn't be damned or destroyed. In the basement of this building, there is a glass plate in the concrete floor that allows those who wish to do so to see the still running spring. Josiah left this property to his oldest son, Thomas Jefferson Howe, who built a home by the spring. Then in 1857, the counties were divided into smaller portions and the newly created Howell County was named for Thomas, not for his father Josiah, the first permanent settler. West Plains was then chosen as county seat of Howell County. In 1860, the population of Howell County was 3,200. West Plains had 150 citizens. There were two good stores, one livery stable, one first great saloon, if there is such a thing, several good dwellings and a passable frame courthouse. The public square was laid out following the Lancaster Square design. This type of square has streets that enter the square in the middle of each side. One historian claims that the original plat for the square was drawn out by our old friend, Judge John R. Woodside. During the Civil War, West Plains was on the border between the Union and Confederate forces. Both West Plains, which was essentially burned to the ground, and Howe County were devastated by years of intense guerrilla warfare. Confederate Brigadier General James Hagen McBride ordered all Union sympathizers in West Plains and Howe County to leave. They were allowed to take only what they could carry leaving behind comfortable homes, household goods, livestock, food, and clothing. Refugees gathered at Rolla, the nearest safe place or for Union sympathizers. In those days, there were no schools, hardly any churches, and people did not congregate like they do now. When the refugees arrived at Rolla after working in freezing rain, 
Their clothing was frozen to their bodies. All the buildings were full to capacity and the refugees were forced to live in tents. The measles epidemic swept through the area and hundreds died of pneumonia and exposed to the winter weather. By the war's end, somewhere between 150 and 300 people remained in Howell County. Of the 3,129 people who lived there when the war began in 1861. By 1870, West Plains prospered again. It boasted a population of 250, a courthouse, a newspaper, numerous merchants, a tannery, two wagon makers, a blacksmith, a church, a tavern, a makeshift school, a teacher, and three physicians. With the arrival of the railroad in 1883, its post-war resurrection was complete. In 1883, West Plains was proclaimed a fourth-class city following the election. 86 voted yes and, and 19, 19 no. In those days, women were not allowed to vote. Is Josiah Howe's grave under the Arcade Hotel? In front of us, down Walnut Street, is the site of the once prestigious West Plains Arcade Hotel. Built in 1901, some claim it was built right on top of Josiah Howe's grave. After all, there is no record of Josiah Howe's remains being executed before its construction. The arcade in its heyday was the largest, most elegant hotel in the area. Built of brick by Judge W. N. Evans, it was three stories tall, had a basement, 22 sleeping rooms, steam heat, hot and cold running water, and electric lights. It cost more than a dollar a night to rent a room there and was so well built that the Arcade Hotel was virtually undamaged by the nearby blast from the dance hall explosion in 1928. It remained in operation until the early 1960s. Speaking of the dance hall explosion, it happened right on this corner. The Ward Building, owned by Mrs. Leland Ward, housed the Weiser Garage, owned by J.M. Babe Weiser on the ground floor. But the second floor was the Bond Hall, which was rented out for community and private events like wedding showers, anniversary parties, club meetings, and dances. On Friday, April 13, 1928, Robert and Sula Maxie Martin rented Bond Hall to hold the first dance after Lent. Sixty people attended the dance. Most were young and children of prominent families. At 11.10 p.m., the band had struck up the last song of their set, a slow dance tune called At Sundown. They never finished the song. At that moment, a powerful explosion ripped through the garage, reducing it and everything above it to fiery ruins, killing or seriously injuring almost an entire generation of West Plains' finest in one awful moment. At dawn, all that remained was a deep hole filled with a gigantic smoking pile of debris and the remains of 39 hapless souls. More than half of them unidentifiable or never found. Fifty others who were in the hall or nearby were injured, some terribly. J.M. Weiser, the garage owner, also perished in the blast, but he was found dead behind the building with the doorknob from his garage door in his hand. Reminds me of Dale Howe told me the story about the night of the explosion. Outside, you got outside. I think he was in the band. Dale was playing his saxophone. Right. And it was, uh, he was thrown by an explosion and it had this in it. And my great uncle uh, died there. Uh, he was not even supposed to go to the uh, dance hall. He was going to a movie with a friend and came back. Uh, the story goes, he was just at the top of the stairs when it exploded. They were able to identify his body. Uh, he was not burnt. Uh, some of the bodies were burnt badly. And there were people wanting to overhear the dance from Ava, and so their relatives, who well, they were uh, killed in the explosion, always said, oh, we felt the explosion. All the way to Ava. 
That's 55 miles west of there, so. The explosion made national news and the blast could be heard as far away as there. While there are many theories, from sewer gas to improperly stored dynamite, the exact cause of the explosion has never been determined. Across East Main Street to our right, where West Plates Bank now stands, is the site of another garage, the one owned by Carrick W. Davidson. Davidson uh, Motor Company over here where uh, Sheriff Kelly was shot and killed by the mob marker gang. And that's my dad's business right across the street. That's where they shot Sheriff Kelly. Oh. In that garage. In that garage the garage there, yeah. yeah. But that was after the post office was already done, after the, when they shot the sheriff. Yeah. Uh, oh. That was before the explosion, because you can still see the building. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, did the explosion take out the buildings on the other side, too? It took out the front of my dad's store. Did it? Yeah. Oh. In mid-December 1931, many alarmed West Plains citizens were on the lookout for any signs of the notorious Barker Carpus gang who were suspected of robbing McCallum's menswear on December 17th. For several days, two suspicious men in a blue DeSoto had been seen in the area, and on December 19th, two men drove their blue DeSoto sedan into Davidson's garage to have a tire fixed. The attendant on duty began fixing the tire, but garage owner Kerry Davidson recognized the car. He stepped out of the garage to contact the sheriff. Luckily, Sheriff C. Roy Kelly was just walking out of the post office. Kelly rarely carried a gun, but with the recent robbery and other suspicious activities in the area, he retrieved a pistol from his car. He approached the garage and saw the men sitting in the car. When he opened the door of the car to question the men inside, Alvin Carpus shot Kelly four times killing him. Carpus and a man later identified as Fred Barker, Ma's son, fled the scene on foot. Four and a half years later, Carpus was arrested by FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover himself. Ma Barker and her son were killed in a shootout in Florida on January 16, 1935. While the present headquarters of the locally owned multi-branch West Plains Bank is located on your right facing Court Square, the bank long resided across the street on the left. Built in 1916, the stately building was occupied by the bank until 1978 when the new building was completed. The building at left was well made, but it was not built to withstand explosions next door. In the dance hall tragedy, the building remained standing but lost its entire back wall, which had to be rebuilt. The Court Square Historic District sits on approximately 11.5 acres and contains 46 historic buildings constructed from 1881 to 1950. It received its historic designation in 2003. This is the new Oak Courthouse. Built in the 30s, the Victorian courthouse, which is really pretty, uh, was shaken so badly during the explosion uh, that it had to be condemned. Uh, they did sneak in and get uh, a lot of the records found with those, uh, but rebuilt this uh, during the Depression. And the first courthouse, of course, was burned during the Civil War because it was just an all wood structure. The average age of the buildings around the square, not including Cobb County Office Building and uh, West Plains Bank, and of course the courthouse. Farmers and Merchants Bank. Built in 1893, this stone building's interior is elegant and it and the vault are still in use today. The bank itself moved to other quarters in 1896 and then moved again before eventually earning the dubious distinction of being the first bank to close its doors permanently at the beginning of the Great Depression. City Drugstore 
and first location of First National Bank. This structure, now home to Wiles Abstract Office, was the first brick building constructed in West Plains out of locally made brick. It originally housed a pharmacy, but was purchased in 1890 to become the Howe County Bank. The Harlan family, an Ozark County banking family who first established the Howe County Bank in West Plains, entered into a partnership with local investors to form the first national bank in 1917. They soon needed more space and relocated to another corner of the square. We'll be there in a minute. But first let's pause and look to our right, down Washington Avenue, across the tracks and up to the hilltop where the street disappears. It was at that spot, about halfway up the hill, that the 3rd Iowa Cavalry and the 6th Missouri Cavalry set up a mountain howitzer and fired at Confederate soldiers camping on the grounds of the courthouse. The Battle of West Plains was fought February 19, 1862, and uh, the Confederate Army was here and they had taken over the courthouse. And the Union Army was up at Houston, Missouri. They brought a hundred men, cavalry, down, and they brought two cannons. They, they fired the cannons completely through the courthouse and, and demolished it pretty much. They divided their soldiers, and 50 of them went into the courthouse from East Main and 50 from West Main, and they killed uh, over half a dozen of Confederate soldiers and wounded 16 others, and the rest of them, they, they ran them off and they were left and went down to South Fork, but that was the Battle of West Plains. The courthouse was leveled, as was most of the downtown area. When West Plains residents returned after the war, one of the first buildings they constructed was a new courthouse. Tucked into the northwest corner of the square and down Elledge Arcade stands the original building where Mr. S. L. Elledge, famous grocery, was located. Built in 1889, it was the first grocery store in West Plains to carry food items pre-packaged in cans, cartons, and sacks. Before this, merchants sold most items in bulk. Flour, crackers, pickles, and even nails and hardware came shipped in wooden barrels and kegs of various sizes. Once the railroad came to town, though, Famous Grocery even carried such exotic items as bananas. With the building's unique herringbone pattern ceiling, it was one of the first in the area to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2001. The expanding First National Bank built its new headquarters on the corner of Court Square and West Main, across the street from the Catherine Opera House and next to the world-famous Ward Leather Company. Since the 1880s, Ward's was famous for making fine harness for horses and oxen, but with the advent of motor vehicles, they adapted to a changing culture and put their focus on fine, substantial leather luggage, which became known worldwide. After World War II and the loss of a servant class, those leather satchels and suitcases were exchanged for luggage made from lighter, sturdy materials. When wards closed, the adjacent First National Bank bought the property, raised the building, and expanded the bank once more. Over the decades, the bank changed owners many times, from First National to Sinterre to Bowman's to Bank of America and finally to Arvest. The structure itself was eventually sold to the county to become a government annex for the Howe County Courthouse. It now houses several county offices. The West Plains grew by like 600% between 1880 and 1890. And guess what that was? The railroad. <laughs> 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 Built in 1893, the Catron Opera House was the first called the Johnson Opera House. Thomas Johnson soon sold his interest in the building to partner Oliver Hazard Perry Catron, and the name was changed. 
With the arrival of the railroad in 1883, West Plains population exploded from 350 to 2,091 people, and the ensuing prosperity made the Opera House feasible. One of the most exciting things in West Plains, it had everything here because it had literally a place where dances were done, where photographers were done, uh, the top floor was a basketball court, uh, so you could do anything on that top floor. And it's still the same time that tongue and brew flooring as was there. The windows are all still the same, and the bricks are still the same. The courthouse was condemned after the explosion. And it literally shook everything in town. A lot of those county offices went over. The post office was in there one time. But, uh, the court was in there. Uh, the armory was in there one time. This monument, affixed to a large boulder on the courthouse lawn, is a memorial to the six Confederate soldiers killed in the skirmish of West Plains on February 19, 1862. The same skirmish raised the courthouse and much of the square. Only about a dozen families remained in the county during the Civil War. If the few men who did remain were frequently obliged to lay out to hide in the woods or caves for weeks at a time to avoid being captured or killed, numbers of old men and non-combatants were shot down at, at their homes by wandering bands of irresponsible marauders. Several men tried to remain neutral during the war, but both armies were uh, looking for able-bodied men, and when the group of soldiers came by, they gave men a choice, join up with us or be shot. Of course, they joined that army, and when their enlistment period was up, they would either re-enlist in that army or go back home and enlist in the army on the other side. I know of several Howe County men who fought on both sides. In 1865, when the war ended, the governor of Missouri appointed William Mox to oversee the imposition of martial law. Early in the war, Mox, a West Plains resident, was seized by the Confederates who threatened to hang him if he refused to join their ranks. He escaped, walked 100 miles to Springfield, and joined the Union Army. In his post-war assignment, he treated the former Confederates who attempted to return home at war's end ruthlessly. Nevertheless, order was eventually restored, and by 1870, the city of West Plains had begun to rebuild. We just went by uh, Dades. It was a hardware store back 1800s. Yeah. Burned down at least once. One of the biggest businesses sustained over the century. It had all of her things. People got dressed up to come. The Aid Building, built in 1914, is not the original home of Aid Hardware. The original building was built on the same site in 1885 by Charles T. Aid, a traveling tinsmith who journeyed west from Pennsylvania to seek his fortune. Aid first considered Branson but found it too inaccessible at the time, so he decided to check out rumors that a railroad was coming to West Plains. The first building he constructed was smaller than this one and had a second story that housed the city's telephone company after it outgrew its first home on Washington Avenue. The generator that powered the phone company also powered the hardware store's electric lights. But one night the phone company electrical system shorted out, causing a fire that consumed the entire structure. It was rebuilt as you see it today in 1914. After witnessing the aftermath of that and other fires, CTA built this new 42,000 square foot structure to be as fireproof as possible. It included a state-of-the-art sprinkler system on every floor and used paving brick in its exterior walls because the aid knew the harder bricks would endure decades longer than regular brick. And it has. Records from its construction reveal the present building cost $25,000, a fortune in 1914 and 15. The loss of the earlier structure and its contents was valued at $50,000. The business thrived for more than 100 years before closing its doors at the hardware store in 1990, 
when it finally succumbed to competition from big box stores. The building soon reopened as an antique mall. I have a friend, Jack McNamara, who sold one time there was a circus in town and they were camped out down by where the Civic Center is now and they brought the elephants up around the square because he said that everybody in the town was to bring the hay <laughs> to feed the animals. And what's pretty cool, the entire square is covered with people. Uh, uh, this was 1913 and they all had suits on, hats, suits, long dresses, the women wore to the circus. A neo-art deco style theater, the Avenue Theater is a former movie theater owned and operated by Dean Davis Jr. It opened in 1950 when it screened Fancy Pants starring Bob Hope and Lucille Ball. At that time, the Avenue was a segregated theater with colored seating in the balcony. In the mid-1980s, the Avenue Theater was purchased by the Grisham family who intended to use it as a warehouse for G&W Foods the family-owned grocery chain. Instead, the family later donated the building to a large nonprofit organization, Arts on the Avenue, which reopened the facility as a live performance community theater. It has been the area's performance art theater since and is utilized by community theater groups, children's theater productions, as well as live performances produced by the West Plains High School Theater Department and other performing arts groups. Restoration efforts have given the theater a new lease on life, including making it ADA compliant. At Wright is the Ozark Small Business Incubator. Installed in the renovated Butler Furniture Store building, the incubator offers qualifying clients an opportunity to create, build, and operate a multitude of businesses. It is designed to offer support for entrepreneurs and business owners at all stages in their business development. Osby opened its doors in January 2012. It was the ninth incubator in Missouri to open and is a nonprofit entrepreneurial assistance organization serving Douglas, Howell, Oregon, Ozark, Shannon, Texas, and Wright counties. And is this where the old city well was? Yes, first well. Uh, first first well. well on the south, or the north side of the railroad. North side of the railroad. Right. The first public well, powered by a gasoline engine pump and installed around 1900, was on Washington Avenue in a building now housing a warehouse for city electricians. Water was first piped to an elevated water tank that served steam locomotives, to a public watering trough for livestock, and to a hydrant for public use. They had one hydrant down the road going north, traveling Washington Avenue. That was a central location for everybody. They come in and they, the people lived out in the country, they fill their water tank. That was the water location. They fill up a two or three hundred gallon tank. You didn't pay for it. That was furnished by the city. Pipes were extended under the railroad tracks to provide water access south of the tracks. The pipes ran up Aid Avenue to the still existing first standpipe. For many years, the hydrant at the watering trough was the only water accessible to residents who lived on the north side of the tracks. West Plains Creamery and First Coca-Cola Bottling Plant. Looking to the left, down 3rd Street where Richard's Brothers Mill now stands, is the former location of the first Coca-Cola bottling plant and the West Plains Creamery, a milk processing plant. Here, on the northeast corner of this intersection, is where the Union Artillery piece shelled Court Square in 1862, destroying the first courthouse. The African American community in West Plains is as old as the town itself. Some members of the black population may have arrived with the first settlers as Josiah Howe brought some slaves along with his family. After the Civil War, many came by wagon from North Central Arkansas looking for opportunity. West Plains was the first stop on the route where they were allowed to stay and settle down on the north side of town. This settlement came to be called Illinois Town, but the hill was also referred to using ethnic slurs and racially charged slang that was common culture of the early 20th century. Daddy was a jack of all trades. 
that old house that we lived in, it would just look like the old woman in the shoe. We had the, the water was there, only you had to carry it in the house by, with a water bucket. We was one of the first old house that had running water. It might have been crude, but he, he, we did have it. Mom didn't have to go outside. You got to remember now, you had water coming in the house, but you didn't have no hot water. The hot water come from, we had a wood stove, and you had a reservoir on the stove. You kept the reservoir full. The larger portion of the African Americans in Howe County was made up of people B.F. Olden hired to work in his fruit orchards. Olden recruited several families from Oxford, Mississippi, to whom he provided jobs, meager housing, and 40 acres of land. He built his own house near the hilltop of Illinois town. And we were one of the first houses up on Washington Avenue to have a toilet, bathroom. Now at one time, now I can remember the old toilet used to sit outside, the old privy. I also remember Daddy go out there and dig a hole and move the toilet over. So have more room, cover it up, so they stay out of it. Cause you know what's gonna happen if you sink. You gotta remember we lived across the tracks. We lived north of the tracks. I think because it, it was black folks up there on that hill, you didn't worry about it. That's what I think. The Lincoln School for African Americans, the small white building on the left is the Lincoln School. West Plains African American community was primarily located in this neighborhood. The building also served the educational needs of the wider non-white community. The Lincoln School was said to be the only African American educational facility in the county in 1900, though an early school had been located north of town in a black settlement near Olden along the railroad tracks near the Highway 14 Junction. The Lincoln School was the only such facility in the broader region that included much of South Central Missouri and parts of Northern Arkansas. The school offered instruction through the eighth grade, after which black teenagers had limited options, either move to Springfield, Kansas City, or perhaps Jonesboro, Arkansas, to continue at segregated high school, or stay home and begin working. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, as most families were of limited means, most students stopped at the eighth grade. My name is Crockett Oaks. I'm the last person to attend Lincoln School in Howe County. For the school curriculum, I, we had your, your writing and your, your arithmetic. You just done it. That was part of your daily activity. They used the blackboard a lot. We pulled a lot of our, our lessons off the blackboard. This was the old playground. They moved to the merry-go-round. Used to be a merry-go-round right here. And that was the ball field. <laughs> that old school building had a register, floor register. One of the register was at a circle. One of them was just a square gray. The teacher, I'd always got a spanking. He sat there in that old chair. He taught counting them square. Well, I'd mess up somewhere down the line and I'd get a whack. I'd remember that pretty much. We'd, we'd go home for lunch, come back after. We'd eat there at the house, because we wasn't but about three houses from school. Everything was on Washington Avenue. Now, it wasn't all that delicatessen. Beans and cornbread, that, that's what it was. If you didn't have enough beans, you put them in water in it. <laughs> oh, it didn't, it didn't take us out. We still here. The Lincoln School remained an important community landmark among the county's African American population through desegregation. Rebuilt in the 1920s, the schoolhouse hosted picnics, baseball games, and a playground and other celebratory holiday functions. Directly across from the Lincoln School is the Washington Street Church of Christ. The original Church of Christ building was donated by Barney Oaks, a West Plains African American citizen in the early 1940s. Uncle Barney, he bought the building for this to start the Church of Christ. That building was eventually replaced in the 1950s due to the city's widening of Washington Street. 
Good morning. He the again. The whole church was gathered on whatever the subject was that they were talking about. It went in and all of the people would, would read a verse. Then when it come to us, he'd gather all us kids up right to the front, around the old stove. He'd read the, he'd read the verse, we'd repeat it. That was our, our Sunday school. Usually, Dad and then maybe Uncle Morning. Them guys mostly was the ones that led the singing. They just sung. They didn't, nobody could read any music. You just sung it till it sounded good. time of Barney Oaks's donation, there was only one other church congregation of predominantly African Americans in West Plains. Located directly across the street from the Church of Christ stood the Mount Olive Baptist Church. At its height, Mount Olive served as a vital gathering location for the African American community. It had a fully functioning kitchen used to prepare meals for such gatherings as family reunions, funerals, weddings, and receptions. For decades, these two churches served as proud symbols of success for West Plains' African American community. Mount Olive ceased operating in the mid-1980s and was eventually sold in the mid-1990s. The Church of Christ is still fully operational and holds regular services. Very few of its members are African American, but its historic past is still remembered. This is reflected by a picture of its African American founding members hanging prominently in the main auditorium. A few of the remaining Oaks family members regularly attend. With passing of Merle Oaks Menard, an original Church of Christ member, and the niece of Barney Oaks, her family home was willed to the Church of Christ. The house was eventually demolished to expand the parking lot for its growing congregation. After the Brown versus Board of Education ruling in 1954, black students had the option of attending West Plains' as public schools. Jack McFarland was president, I think, of the school board. He was on it, and I think he was president. And it was a unanimous vote that the African Americans would be accepted into the high school and the grade schools. In 1954. I don't know what we expected. We just knew we was going to we was going to come go to school, white kids. Mm -hmm. But we heard them, the grown folks say about it. They would not let three of I can remember that. They just thought we was going to get over there and get mistreated. We didn't at that time. It wasn't even fathers thing from our mind. You always wondered. They seemed to. Uh, they did this great big old building for one thing. And it was so many kids out there. It was kind of a curiosity type of thing. You seen them out. You seen them out there. You heard them out there, but you didn't know what was taking place. And next thing you know, we was part of that clan. We was we was, we was that we was there. They had such a variety. Yeah, that was that was like I guess Foster School went to the sixth grade. They had six different teachers, more roaming around the hall. You know, we just had that one, and I'm sure it made a lot. It made a lot of difference. I can remember Miss Galloway. She was my first teacher, and uh, not only for her being white, she stood up for probably about five ten to six foot, and she was a she was a whale of a woman. <laughs> And I, I was scared when I first seen her. I was scared when we first left. She was a teacher. She's a third grade teacher. She was a principal. The Margaret Foster School on the right was one of those that welcomed the new students without any serious instance. My dad and uncle back in the day, they played a little bit and they'd go out and play for the white people. Maybe make a dollar or two, maybe get a free beer. They played what they what I call bluegrass. Dad played the guitar, yeah, he played the guitar and he played the, played the piano. My uncle, 
he played the fiddle. Bob Givan played the piano. They had their own style of dancing. Really wasn't no establishment for blacks to to go. They didn't have no work. They didn't have no work except for somebody's house. You, you remember Jack Finley? They had a piano. About six, eight years old. They had uh, they had several black families around. Givans and uh, Finleys, of course. O'Neill, Ball, ten or twelve families. People got to dying off. People got to moving. Next thing you know, we're nobody there but the Oaks. Here it is. I will live and die. Here it is. I let my home fires burn. And I watch my baby sleeping all on a winter's night. And when I leave, I'll know where to return. will return and watch the home fires burn now since the college come in they got to bringing people in and them people families start coming in and it's beginning to be a pretty good community. Now the Yellow House Community Arts Center. This Victorian era gym was at one time the Zorn family home. It went through several owners over the years and was slated for demolition when Nanette Weaver thought that with some TLC it would make a fine little cafe and possible performance space. The building was for sale but Weaver didn't have the wherewithal to buy it. She talked it over with a local physician, Dr. Ken Schaefer, who decided to make the purchase and donate it to a non-for-profit. At that time, the Ozarks Resource Center, an environmental group then based in Ava, was looking for a new home. They had non-profit status, were willing to change their mission to include the Yellow House, and the deal was made. The Yellow House now houses live performances, exhibitions, studio and meeting space. It also has home to the local Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. On the right as you approach West Main was the home of Mr. and Mrs. T.J. Langston and their young ward, Polly. Polly was rescued by Mrs. Langston's father, Dr. Thomas Bradford of Marshfield, Missouri, while on a business trip in New Orleans. In 1880, what they called or referred to as the Cyclone of Marshfield hit, killed about a hundred people. and and uh, Mr. Bradford and the son Sidney was killed in this terrible, terrible uh, tornado. But after that, she just kept saying, Hey, Ma, where's Paul? Where's Buddy? That's what she called Sidney. And this really disturbed Mrs. Uh, Bradford. Finally, she decided to send Polly to West Plains to her daughter, who was married to Thomas Jefferson Langston, who owned the Langston Mercantile in West Plains. Now, Mrs. Langston was host to the Ladies' Aid Society, and they met at her house regularly. And as she uh, uh, was, Polly was always there, and she would hear the ladies talking, and she would say, well, goodbye, Mrs. Smith. It was awfully nice having you. Oh, the cream was delicious. And uh, do come again. And uh, oh, yes, thank you. And so she would just go on on that way. Everyone in West Plains loved her because uh, the Langston family lived on what is now Langston Street across from uh, uh, the Robinson Drago Funeral Home and she spent a lot of time out on the front porch and, and would take time to, to talk to people as they would pass by. So she became really popular all over uh, in Howe County and was much uh, respected and loved by the citizens of our area. When she died, she was buried in the Langston family plot, which we'll visit when the tour reaches the cemetery. Around us now, we see the footprint of the Missouri State University West Plains campus, formerly known as Southwest Missouri State University and founded in 1963. MSU West Plains has an enrollment of around 2,000 students. The two-year campus of the MSU system 
primarily serve students from the seven county region, many of whom are the first in their families to attend college. The Kellett residence, now Kellett Hall, was the first permanent home for the West Plains campus. In 1973, it became part of the SMSU's Residence Center. Until that time, the Residence Center held classes at the West Plains High School. Kellett Hall allowed the campus to offer daytime classes in addition to its night school. In 1977, a 4,200-square-foot addition to Kellett Hall was built. The addition was completed in 1980. Space was later added to house the nursing program, and an elevator was added to meet ADA requirements. From those early beginnings, the MSU West Plains campus footprint has grown significantly in size, enrollment, and educational opportunities. The Smith London Centennial Bell Tower chimes and plays music at the quarter hour. It was dedicated in 2005. Recently, an amphitheater was added below the bell tower. The bell tower, all right. Well, it's been a lovely icon to have for the university property. It is. Now it's time going to college, the college I went to, with memorable buildings. This is a memorable building. You just remember forever. Yeah. It really is. It really is. So many of the great uh, MSU fathers, you know, they could have put that out on the edge of town and, and uh, probably been beaded a hundred acres if they'd have wanted it. I remember even after I was doing the development, I had a call from someone who offered us 125 acres if we would move out the yep. town. And it was not very far out of town. It would have been so much cheaper and easier to have done that. Right. But the university made that decision at that time that it was really critical that this remain in, in the middle of the community, symbolic. Well, it's such an important part of the town. It, it is. is. The stately building on the left, now known as Kellett Hall, was built in the late 1920s by M.B. Clark, who later became a vice president of the first Southwest Missouri State University Board of Regents. Shortly after the home was constructed, Jerome Boyer, owner of the West Plains Telephone Company and stepfather of Robert Nethery, founder of the Ozarks Radio Network, decided to buy the home to house his large family. But his wife wouldn't hear of it. She said it was just too far out in the woods. In 1929, it was purchased by Howard Kellett, then president of the First National Bank. After his death in 1973, his wife, Mrs. Ruth Kellett, donated the four-story Georgian-style home to SMSU to be part of the institution's residence center as a memorial to her late husband. In 1995, the roof and third floor were heavily damaged in a fire. The building sustained smoke and water damage throughout. Renovations and repairs were completed in 1997, and the building is now primarily used for administrative offices and some classrooms. One of the most iconic early pioneer homes in West Plains isn't a pioneer home at all, though it resembles one. Leela Strickland built a house in Arkansas that looked exactly like an early pioneer home. When she decided to move to West Plains, she couldn't bear to leave her beloved home behind. Strickland hired a crew to move it, stick by stick, stone by stone, to this spacious lot on Lida Street between Monks and Pierce Streets. Strickland enjoyed the home throughout the remainder of her life. In 2005, it was acquired by a local business owner who currently lives there. The original Harlan House was built in 1889 and was called Shadow Lawn by the Harlan family. This was the home of Mr. and Mrs. James P. Harlan, former mayor of West Plains. A modern addition to the house includes a large art gallery space and a downstairs history museum. It now houses the artwork and background notes of Lennis L. Broadfoot. The Broadfoot collection is a must-see for a window into the 1930s Ozarks life. Thank you. 
The Harlan family had built an earlier museum and gallery space on the other side of the house and willed it to the city. But the widowed Mrs. Harlan went to City Hall one day to pay her utility bill and she was roundly scolded by a young clerk for being late with her payment. Deeply offended to how she'd been treated, especially after her husband's service to the town and their generous gift, she called her attorney and simply took it back. The Chasen City arranged to build the current museum and gallery with other donations. On our left is the First Presbyterian Church. This is believed to be the oldest standing public building in Howe County. According to my information, it is the oldest church in West Plains well, because we have the first conducted services here. Now, some people at the Episcopal Church think theirs is because they had the first permanent house. The front portion of the brick edifice facing you is the original structure built in 1885 at a cost of $4,000. In 1910, the back portion of the building was added, and in 1978, the side portion was constructed. Across the street on the right at the same intersection is the Zorn Business Building. It was built in 1912 by W.J. Zorn, who was then owner and operated the Howe County Gazette, one of the town's first newspapers. He also served as West Plains Postmaster from 1915 to 1922, and after Zorn passed away, a family rift opened over the inheritances. W.J. left most of his fortune to his two daughters and only a little bit to his son. He was talking about Harry Zorn and uh, Daisy Brown, his sister. Well, as Al intimated, there were certain troubles within the family, and Daisy had uh, purchased a new Ford Model A four-door sedan, and uh, it irritated Harry because uh, she had the money to do that, and he didn't have the money. He, she had gotten considerable money from her father. He got mad, and he went to AIDS. He was working at Red Apple. He went up to AIDS and bought a new axe, and went out and took that axe to the new Ford sedan. And that's absolutely the way it was, too. And that, that car looked pretty rough after he got through with it. So that's the story now. According to the Aid family, Zorn never paid for the axe. Built in 1888, little has changed since the cornerstone of All Saints Episcopal Church was laid. One of the oldest public buildings in Howe County or the surrounding counties this property was, in fact, the site of the first cemetery in West Plains. In order to construct the church, the bodies were disinterred and moved for reburial at the new Oakland Cemetery to the southeast. This building was, uh, was reported to be the oldest uh, building in, in, in Howe County although that's been given up to the Presbyterian Church. But it is interesting to me, this whole building, pretty much like you see it, was all a kit. Uh, pews, windows, the whole shebang, the organ, everything. And that's why if you travel around the country, you can see churches just like this if they've been preserved, because they too ordered a kit. The organ was powered by two small boys who crawled in underneath it to pump the bellows. The boys were later replaced by an electric motor. In its heyday in the early 1900s, Grace Avenue was known as Professionals Row, with many prominent local doctors, pharmacists, bankers, and founding families living along the street. It was also the most direct route from large cattle ranches east of town to the stockyards then located next to the railroad yards just north of the Civic Center. And when they would bring cattle from uh, Point South, Central Arkansas, they would bring them to the sale bar, which is behind us, about where the Civic Center is, and they would drive them up uh, west on Grace Avenue here, and this is cool, 
had a house right there on the corner, which she was a kindergarten teacher for years. I think she was dead. She was my kindergarten teacher. <laughs> uh, but the cattle would wind up in her front yard. And uh, it was always a, a lot of uh, give and take about that. West Plains is still home to one of the largest sale barn enterprises in the country, but it's no longer at the end of Grace Avenue. This house, probably the best example of the structures on Professionals Row, was completed in 1897 by Joseph Norley, the superintendent of a nearby 414-acre peach orchard. Mr. Norley promised his wife he would build her the biggest house in town if she bore him a son. This she did and the house was reputed to be the first in West Plains to have running water, gravity fed from a large tank in the attic which was fed by rainwater collected from the roof. The next owner, Dr. Robert Hogan, was one of many bank presidents from a prominent West Plains business family. On December 13, 1925, his wife delivered actor Dick Van Dyke at their medical facility, one block north of their Grace Avenue home. Dr. Hogan named that structure the Krista Hogan Hospital after his mother. My mother was in there a couple times and I remember being in there when I was little with her. It was the high ceilings and the wood floors and the wood stairways. She was the cook and she said at noon Everybody that was working there came in and ate. He came and stayed with mom and delivered two babies. Yeah, he was pretty proud of her. And every time he had a birthday, she, uh, she would bake him an angel food cake and take it to him. That was his favorite. And you know what I remember most about him? We didn't have a phone, so dad would have to go and Town and tell him that he needs to come see us. And here he'd come. And I thought he was rich because I'd be sick in the bed and he'd get ready to leave and he'd reach in his pocket and get some change out. And I don't know what he'd put, a couple quarters or something on my bed. Well, that was a rich man. Made me get well quicker. Probably I called him more than I should. <laughs> he was a nice, really a nice man. Times were hard, <laughs> but it was a nice, warm, cozy feeling just having everybody there. In June 2017, Kevin and Brenda Smith of West Plains purchased the house at public auction. They have restored the house to its earlier splendor. Dr. and Mrs. Hogan were the parents of John E. Hogan, a B-17 tail gunner, remembered at Hogan Memorial Gravesite. Our house uh, for six generations right across the street. This is where uh, my great-grandparents were uh, at when, uh, during the explosion. And uh, shortly after that, they built the rock front porch and put his uh, initials in the in the concrete pillar. This house is the lifetime home of Judge David Paul Evans. David and Sandy Evans raised four children in this house, the home to six Evans family generations. The house was built by M. A. Cooper as a farm home on West Plains' eastern edge. Dr. Evans installed the first whole house electrical appliance system in Missouri in 1917, which included an electric clothes washer, mixer, and whole house electric vacuum. Dr. Evans was an inventor, veterinarian, MU professor of cellular biology, botanist, and director of the Mountain Grove Fruit Experiment Station for 18 years. Dr. Evans was also the first to experiment with artificially inseminating cattle in the United States. Paul and Zella's son, Paul Jr., attended and died at the dance hall explosion on Friday, April 13, 1928. Dad always told the story about the dance hall explosion that uh, Paul and Zella, his grandparents, my great-grandparents, were sitting in the living room, Paul in his uh, uh, chair and, and Zella in her rocker, and they heard uh, a huge explosion. It rattled the windows of the house, 
and they looked at each other. Uh, Zell got up, walked over, and sat in Paul's lap, her husband, and said, Paul Jr. just died. And Dr. Paul said, yes, I know. Uh, he left the house, uh, traveled down s five or six blocks to where the explosion is, and identified his son, Paul Jr. as the first one uh, they identified uh, from the explosion. And after that, uh, when uh, Dr. Paul built the front porch, she put Paul Jr.'s uh, initials, uh, cast them in concrete, uh, and they're still there on the front porch of the house. David Paul Evans was elected our state representative in 2018 after having retired as the presiding circuit judge of the 37th Judicial Circuit. It is Sandy and David's hope that the historic house will someday be the home for a seventh generation of Evans' children. Oaklawn Cemetery was originally known as Oak Grove Cemetery. Name was changed to Oak Lawn in 1907. The rock wall was built by the WPA workers in the early 1930s during the Depression. The oldest tombstone is dated in 1856. There are a lot of Civil War veterans buried here. Any uh, military person is allowed to have a free tombstone, so many, uh, most of the Civil War veterans have tombstones. The Rock of Ages monument was erected October 6, 1929, with the unidentified dead from the April 13th West Plains Dance Hall explosion. Some believe the monument was haunted because for several years, city workers often had to move the top part of the large granite monument back to its center. Area youth often went to the cemetery hoping to see the monument dance. The idea that the monument was haunted was exasperated by some of the townspeople who believed the explosion was the sinful dancer's punishment. But when diesel locomotives replaced steam locomotives, the stone stopped moving out of place. And coming up on the Hogan family grave. Is that Dr. Hogan? Yeah, uh, and their son, who was killed in, in World War II as a B-17 uh, tail gunner, the stone on the right is his memorial stone. On September 13, 1944, Staff Sergeant John E. Hogan, a B-17 tail gunner, was wakened and called to an urgent briefing. They were ordered to execute a bombing run on the Merseburg German oil refinery. Although Hogan had participated in 10 previous missions, this would be his first and last daytime mission. Their aircraft, known as Mag the Hag, took heavy flak on the mission, and though they successfully hit their target, the plane lost altitude and then disappeared from radar. Seventy years later, in 2014, a German citizen digging a grave of a family member in Neustadt, Germany, found Hogan's dog tanks. The wartime crash site had never been reported. Hogan's remains were eventually returned to the States where he was buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery. This monument in the Hogan family grave plot commemorates his sacrifice for our country. Right over here, Dustin. Yep, right there. Uh, the story is, is that that is the cannonball that hit the, the uh, courthouse during the Civil War skirmish. But all of the uh, Civil War historians that I've ever talked to said that's far too big of a cannonball to be shot from a, uh, a cannon that was carried on the back of a mule or a horse. It's not the size of a grapefruit. That would take a pretty big guy to shoot at a quarter mile. Right, right. On the left is Colonel Monk, uh, the large stone right there. You see the two uh, yeah. covers? Yeah. Or yeah. Oh. Right next to it is my grandparents, great grandparents, right. and Paul's that died in the explosion. Okay. 
During the Civil War, many families had members on both sides of the conflict. Like most in the area, the McFarland family supported the Union. Some Civil War historians suggest that those who supported the South constructed their monument stones with a sharp edge pointing up to prevent the damn Yankees from sitting on their graves. Evidently, the McFarlands didn't want anyone sitting on their grave marker either. Great-grandfather, great-grandmother, grandfather, grandmother, mom, dad, part of and my brother are all uh, at least parts of them scattered there. Mary Catherine McFarland, Kitty, died in a West Plains dance hall explosion. She's buried in this family plot. As you exit the cemetery, notice the rock wall on the perimeter built during this Great Depression and remembered with pride. Before Alice Farmer Risley died, she was the last surviving Civil War nurse. Alice was born in Wilmington, Ohio, and moved to New Iberia, Louisiana. After the war broke out, she moved to New Orleans. The Union held the city, and Alice volunteered as a nurse. For some time after the war ended, Alice corresponded with a former patient, Samuel Risley. The two eventually married and moved to West Plains. Samuel established the South Missouri Journal and became one of the city's first newspaper men. The two were appointed postmaster and assistant postmistress. In her later years, Alice was honored as the First Lady of West Plains. The Langston family grave marker is very large, easily seen on the corner of this intersection. On the right side of the family plot, in the front, is a petite little stone that marks Polly's gravesite. You may wonder at the size of Polly's gravestone, but you see Polly was of surprisingly exotic origins. Polly was a parrot. She was born, or hatched, in 1867, and in 1920, uh, almost 53 years later, she died. And the family loved her so much they couldn't think of anything but to take her to Oakland Cemetery and bury her in the Langston burial plot. And Polly has her own tombstone that says, Polly, 1867-1920. Every small town has its own stories. We hope you've enjoyed this journey into the deep history and culture of West Plains and the Ozark Highlands. And as we in the Ozarks have always said, when taking our leave after an enjoyable visit, which we hate to see come to an end, y'all better just come and go home with us.